go live. I was going to share the screen with the uh, the legal notice. Thanks everyone for meeting. I know it was a little odd with all the um, the uncertainty around how we're meeting. Yeah. Hold it off, Nate. Well, the governor, I right. think. We got the governor to sign. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You have, Nate, you have a lot of pull uh, in uh, Boston, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's really funny. We were talking with staff the other day, and they're like, you know, of all the things to be concerned about, it's like, well, at least you can have alcohol to go, but you know, it really matters, like open meeting law. It just it wasn't happening. <laughs> so, um, it's funny. All right, so we do have some people here. The um, you know, this is a, a um, just everyone's listening. This is you know, through Zoom, the governor just extended legislation allowing remote participation in meetings, um, as of. You know, went back, I guess, two days. So it continued from the state of emergency and it's ongoing now. So we're holding this through Zoom and we will, um, all future block grant meetings for the 21 process, you know, in the next few months will all be by Zoom too, just so there's no, you know, it shouldn't happen like it did today with with a parallel notice and maybe a in person or not, but it'll be all through Zoom. I think this is it, Gail. So when you're ready, we have, um, you probably introduce the committee and okay. uh, we have five members now. I'm just looking at who else is Okay, here. and um, we're, it, because it's being recorded, we don't have, are you taking, still taking notes? I think, yeah, we still have to type minutes for this. I think Ben might be, or we use the transcript. Right. Yeah. Oh, Ben's the yeah. scribe. Okay. All right, well, welcome to um, our public hearing to discuss the community priorities for the 2021 application process for the CD BG um, funds and the whole allocation process. So um, we were going to begin to talk about social services first and um, how do we want to go about with participation from those in attendance, um, Nate? Yeah, um, well, Gail, do just want maybe we introduce ourselves oh, okay. and then- um... Yeah, I'm sorry, but this is a committee. Um, We'll go down, I'll start at the top. I'll, I'll introduce myself first. I'm Gail Lansky. I'm the chair of this committee and um, above me is Becky who can introduce herself. Hi everybody, I'm Becky Michaels. Um, this is my first round of um, reviewing applications on the committee, but I'm really happy to be here. Okay, Nat. Yes, hello, I'm Nat Larson. I've been on the committee for a couple of years and looking forward to this um, new round. And Rika. Hi, I'm Rika Clement. I'm also new to the committee. So this is my first round and I uh, look forward to it. Thank you. And Lucas. Yes, hi, Lucas Hanscom, um, also new. So, and I will announce that Paul Goulston, who's been a member of the committee for maybe four or five years, um, submitted his resignation today. So we will discuss um, the implications of that later on. And just for everyone listening, there, I'm Nate Malloy, a staff person, planner with the town. And then there's Ben Bregger, who's also a planner and helping to staff the committee. And this hearing is being held as part of the 2021 grant process to um, hear community priorities for funding. Uh, the committee held a hearing uh, a few weeks ago that also had um, this discussion. So it is somewhat repetitive, but it's just a chance to get everyone else an opportunity to speak if they didn't. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I think we've emailed everyone, but just to give a quick update, the state, you know, at first was not going to hold this 21 process, and then they decided to have one um, somewhat abbreviated during the summer. So it's June through September. So we have, um, you know, we're having outreach tonight. We're trying to get the request for proposals out and due by the end of July. The committee will review and make recommendations in August, and then we have to submit, the town has to submit its application to DHCD uh, by September 10th. So it's a pretty quick process this year. Um, and then, you know, the 22 process, which usually st starts in the fall with applications due in the spring, I, I think may happen at that time. Um, the state's considering maybe pushing the 22 process back into the summer like it is now. Um, but for now, um, it may just be, you know, we apply, this funding becomes available earlier than usual and then, or at the same time, and then we apply for the 22 process. So it might be a quick turnaround between two applications. But for now, it's the 21 uh, priorities for the 21 process. Uh, 
So are we going to hear from um, participants in the, in the audience regarding social services? Yeah, I think, yeah, we could, um, if you, if anyone raises their hand, I think, you know, the, the order they raise their hand and they just populate and we can go down the list, uh, Gail, and then, you know, we can provide uh, opportunities that way. All right. And then somebody named Marta Alvarez um, is in the chat and she is a part-time volunteer at Olympia Oaks and Caitlin invited her to the meeting. So I'm not sure um, where we fit her into the list of speakers. I think she could speak just, you know, to any, if she's if her asking about, you know, discussing social services or any priorities, I think she could speak to any of those. Um, okay, but in, in, as far as where she is in the queue, I guess that's my question. Oh, um, I, I don't, you know, if she raises her hand to speak, Marta, that's fine. I mean, otherwise, um, you know, I don't, unless there's a reason she has to leave early, but. Okay. Uh, and there's, you know, there's 17, uh, well, I think it's, oh, yeah, actually there's 17 people in attendance, so it's a, it's a good turnout. All right. Gail, can I ask a question before we get started? Yes. Is that sure. okay? So I just want to clarify. So what we're doing tonight is determining what priorities we're going to list in the social services section and then which priorities we're going to list in the non-social services section, correct? So okay. what the public would be speaking to is the priority, not to what their own agencies do tonight, but the priorities they believe should be there, correct? I would say yes, correct. And then I guess I wondered if maybe it would be helpful if there are people on who are not, um, who haven't done applications before, if we just went over what they have been in the past and, and were the last round. Um, um, Nate, can you put up, do you have the opportunity, do you have the, um, not the opportunity, but can you put up what our priorities were for um, the last round? Yeah, so I think you know this is the the public notice is is it that viewable right now? So we can I'll do a new share and I can show the um, the previous uh, social service priorities if that's what we're speaking about. Good suggestion, Becky. Thank you. Sorry, that's a little big, isn't it? And so. You know, and then, you know, after the public hearing, just for everyone listening, the committee, um, hopefully we can finalize the, uh, the request for proposals and they can be um, ready this week by the end of the week. So these are the, you know, the uh, and number five, those were the, uh, those were the priorities that we had discussed, you know, had last in the fall, you know, when we thought we were doing our 21 process. So. And I, I guess I would just say, I don't know if the rest of the committee would agree, but what I'd be most interested in hearing um, is whether people believe, whether anybody, members of the public believe that any of these shouldn't be on this list or whether there are any categories that they, they think should be added to this list. I think probably we all agree that all of these are really important and don't necessarily need to hear why these particular ones are important. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I think that makes uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Nate, given the number of people, do you want to limit the amount of time we let them speak so you know we can kind of get through the list fairly quickly? I mean, like three minutes, right? That should be enough. Okay. I, guess, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess we could do a rough time, but. <laughs> okay. So Laura, uh, just you can say your name, and then um, if you have any other information, and then you can share your comments. Okay, hello, my name is Laura Reichsman. I'm the Director of Family Outreach of Amherst. Uh, we are an agency that uh, provides support and stabilization to families uh, in all sorts of different ways. Uh, we've, through CDBG in the past, we've had our housing support um, program uh, that's been very successful and been um, a, uh, a huge need for families, particularly in the last year and a half. Uh, we, uh, while we were still waiting for funding, we, were, we continued the work uh, because so many families were in crisis. Um, 
the there's an eviction moratorium by the CDC that's supposed to be lifted at the end of June. We don't know if that will happen, but if it does, we will have record numbers of people who are will have uh, housing challenges. So um, we have gotten all through uh, the pandemic. We um, were getting three to five calls a week from people we had never heard from before. And, you know, sometimes Amherst can feel like a small town. So for us, after 30 years of doing this work to, to meet so many new people in this last year, speaks to what might happen in this next year. And I think will happen in this next year, where lots of people who never needed help before will need help. And so I would urge the committee to make um, housing as well as just basic family stabilization a, a priority family and individual because uh, so much goes into housing. It's, um, it's finding a job, it's applying for benefits, it's figuring out what to do because the camps aren't taking the same number of kids. And so they have to figure out alternatives so they can keep working so they can pay their rent. There's so many things that go into it. And, um, and they need our help. And we need, um, we need CDBG funds to support these Amherst residents. So that would be my, that, that, those are my two cents. <laughs> and I hope I was under three minutes. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks, Laura. Does anybody have any questions for Laura? I just want to ask, I just want to throw a question out. We have household stabilization and nowhere in all of these do we use the word housing. And I'm just going to throw that out. Maybe that's something we want to think about if we're going to be, um, I don't necessarily setting new priorities, but maybe um, renaming these priorities. So it's something to think about. All right. Thanks, Amherst Community Connections, you can I'm you and you're able to speak. Uh, yes, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Zelensky and uh, the committee members. Thank you for having me here today. I would like to uh, discuss the homelessness facing the participants in our town. Every year we see about 700 unique individuals and half of them, they are either homeless or they are facing eviction. And 80% of these people are from Amherst. So therefore we know our neighbors and we know the resources in the area, whether it's Family Outreach of Amherst or Amherst Survival Center or Nobert alone. So our work is to connect all these services based on their needs, make them available, help them navigating through the system. And our goals are twofold. One is to help them secure subsidized affordable housing for housing stab stabilization purpose. And the second goal we have is to help them achieve financial self-sufficiency in the way that we know how, by getting a job, by applying for disability income, and or by applying for all those public benefits that they are entitled to. So through this work, we believe that everybody should have a roof over their head. In the spirit of housing that our agency has just been awarded uh, recently by the town of Amherst through the CPA funding for a three year, six vouchers to support people who have experienced chronic homelessness in our town. So that's doubling our capacity. We have been receiving for the past six years, three vouchers each year now the town of Amherst has recognized the work we are able to do and the accomplishment that we have made in making the lives of the homeless much easier. So we have been granted over $230,000 for a three-year grant. Put together for the past five years, we have received over half a million dollars of grant money to create housing for people who experience chronic homelessness. And yet in those five years, we have no money to do the support service. That's so crucial in order to help the chronic homeless achieve the housing stabilization and financial self-sufficiency. And we had to do hard work, but thanks to your support for the past two rounds, we were able to receive 
CDBG social service funding to support the men and women in our housing programs. In addition to the Housing First program, also we have a rapid rehousing. Wei Ling, you have one minute left. Okay, thank you. So today I would like to uh, bring to your attention that we have the money to help pay for housing for people who are chronically homeless, but we need your support by providing service dollars to hire caseworkers to help the homeless navigate through the housing system to help them get a job. So I appreciate that you are past support. And today I bear good news to you. With your support, we would be able to accept our $237,000 funding from the town of Amherst for housing if we can secure the support service dollars for that part of our program. Thank you very much. I hope I also stay within the three minutes. Thanks, Wei Ling. Anybody have questions? Okay. I was just gonna ask, um, Wei Ling, do you think that the services that you need are, um, or would be applying for are covered by the list of activities? It sounds like they are. I just wanna make sure that since that's our topic tonight. Hey, Wei Ling, I think I, I disabled your talk, but I think you're available to talk okay. now. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Michaels, for your question. Actually, our request will cover three areas here. One is the individual stabilization. That's the area because we help them stabilize their housing situation and their living situation. And our service will also help them provide service to those who experience homelessness. And the third, but not the last, is we help help them achieve the economic self-sufficiency by helping them to secure employment or offer them opportunity to get certificates to uh, get a better job. So these are three areas our support service that we are applying will cover. And I want to remind you that many things here such as food and nutrition, helping people apply for food stamps, navigating through the meal programs in Amherst or in Northampton or in the surrounding areas, or help them apply for health services, insurance. Those are things that we can provide in our service. So, so I'm sorry to interrupt. I guess my question was just to make sure that, that you saw things on this list that, you're, you, that you would be applying within. And it sounds like what you do meets a lot of these things, but. Yes, I want to uh, thank you for your insight. Uh, many of these services are really covered under the in, in, in benefit specialist we have in-house to help them apply, receive the benefits, such as health insurance or contacting uh, the elder services to help them provide service for the seniors. So it's a one-stop resource center that you are funding for to cover several of these areas. Thank you. Thank you. All right, there's um, Michael. You can unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Michael Chernoff and I wanna speak for a minute about the uh, literacy uh, project, which um, has a site, one of its five sites in Amherst and um, Judith Roberts, our executive director, would have liked to have been here tonight, but she couldn't. I've been a board member at uh, the Literacy Project for about eight or nine years. I kind of lost track. And I also have been a, am a math tutor at the Amherst site. The Literacy Project provides adult education. So um, I think both the economic self-sufficiency and the household stabilization criteria on your list are app applicable to the Literacy Project. Our ultimate goal is to get people their uh, high school equivalency diplomas, um, but also to provide basic literacy uh, services. We have people who basically will say things like, I remember very distinctly a woman saying, I just want to be able to read a story to my grandson. And um, as far as the uh, high school diploma goes, if you think about it, there's so many avenues or so many doors that are closed to people without a high school diploma in terms of getting into college or community college, applying to proprietary schools, getting advanced at their jobs, even getting some jobs require uh, 
a, uh, a high school diploma. So this is an important free service to our students. Um, and, uh, you know, our Amherst site typically has 40 to 50 students at any given time, about 60 to 65% of them are residents of Amherst. So we're serving um, the entire area. Um, this, the program has sites in Franklin and Hampshire counties, but in Amherst, um, we're about, about two thirds, or a little bit under two thirds of our students are Amherst residents. Um, we also work with a lot of immigrants who um, are in Amherst for one reason or another, uh, typically graduates of the Jones ESL, uh, ESOL program or the Center for New Americans. So they come to us basically speaking English. And um, these are people that need access to work. And without a high school diploma, they're really, really handicapped in that regard. So I think it speaks obviously to adult education and economic self-sufficiency, but also I mean, a job is a, an important stabilization force for any individual or, or his or her family. Um, but even more important or perhaps as important is the fact that we do a good job, I think, of giving people a sense of agency, a sense of uh, self-esteem, a sense of control in their own lives as they graduate from the program, get that uh, uh, high school equivalency diploma and, um, these are people that did not have success in school. And for whatever reason, they were not able to continue their education. And that's our job is to you know, help them finish that process. We have a budget of about a million dollars a year. The uh, state education department funds about 65% of that, but it's been a decreasing percentage year to year. And so we are increasingly dependent on grants from you know, uh, towns and cities, we get grants from most of the other towns in which we operate like Northampton and where and-, and Michael, your, your time is, uh, you have about 30 seconds left. Oh, okay. Um, so I don't, also the one thing I would say is that it, at a time when we're very conscious of inequities in, in our society, I think the Literacy Project is trying to address that by giving people um, some agency and the skills to advance themselves in life. Thanks, sorry, I wasn't watching my watch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Anybody have questions for Michael? All right, thanks, Michael. Okay, you bet, thank you, bye-bye. All right, we have uh, Lori. Hi, right, Lori, if you unmute yourself, you can speak. Lori Millman. Okay, hi, thank you um, for giving me the opportunity. It took me a minute to find the uh, unmute button. So I wanna talk to the economic self-sufficiency um, standard because it actually names adult education and job training as a way to help people attain economic independence. And I feel like that's what we do and have been doing with CDBG funding and other funding. Um, and uh, so we, we teach English and we teach um, navigating skills and we teach um, confidence and we connect people to resources. And we have advisors who help people look for and apply for jobs. And we've been remarkably successful. Um, we actually have um, one former student working in the Musanti Health Center. And it looks like the health center might be about to um, hire another one of our students. Um, we also train people to be nurse aides and personal care attendants. And these people get jobs almost immediately. Um, we have been working throughout the pandemic, like I'm sure everybody else here to bridge the digital divide and have purchased and delivered hotspots and tablets to keep people connected. Um, and we help people connect with all the other social service agencies that are providing a safety net, um, whether it's uh, Family Outreach of Amherst or the Survival Center, um, we actually sort of link arms around all of our students. There are a lot of refugees and immigrants living in Amherst. If you look at the Amherst Public School demographics, you will see that um, English language learners continue to outpace the state. 
So you've um, supported this program. We think it's a shrewd investment. It leverages funding from the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And um, people stay in our classes and then they go on and go to Greenfield Community College um, and, they're, and they're working. Um, the folks we work with are the original entrepreneurs, right? They've left everything they own and started fresh um, and tend to be successful. So thank you. Thank you, Laurie. Anybody have questions for her? I'm going to ask essentially the same question that I asked Wayling. Laurie, it, it sounds like what you're saying is that you, what you're, the work you do falls directly into the economic self-sufficiency. Are you, is there anything missing from this list that you think would be appropriate to add as a priority for us? Since tonight we're not considering the specific program, we're looking at what priorities should be listed. Um, well, it looks to me like you've listed most of them. You've listed food and health and housing and um, I, you know, that, that feels to me like a lot of, of what people need to thrive in Amherst. So um, I, it's, I, I'm not seeing anything that's, that's clearly missing. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Right. All right, we have big brother, big sister. Um, you should, you should, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi there, this is Jesse Cooley and I'm the director of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County and um, we're based in Amherst. So we have a couple other people that wanted to share their experience with the program. So I, I will try not to take the full three minutes here. Um, I just wanna be advocating really for the priority area of youth services, um, which perhaps goes without saying, but just to really reiterate that because um, it's something that sometimes can go, um, it can, can be put aside in, in, in the sake, for the sake of other priorities. And while all of the things on this list are really important and they do impact the people that we work with and many in the community, we know that this past year in particular has been incredibly difficult for young people um, in Amherst and everywhere. If you have a young person in your life, you, you probably know this. Um, all of the back and forth with remote learning and the isolation from all the important people in a young person's life has been incredibly difficult. And we know that the need for connection is greater than ever. And this is partly evidenced by the continuing referrals that we get every week from our partners in the schools with whom we work very closely. So we're doing our best at our program to continue matching um, young people with mentors. That's what we do. And um, we just wanna really Thank you for your support and advocate for youth services to continue to be a priority in the coming year. Um, so I'm going to cede my time and I don't know if the other BBBS speakers are next. I know that Ryan Kyle is one of ours, so I'll just point her out and Christina Sharbai as well. Okay, Ryan, you're um, able to speak and then we'll, we'll move on. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ryan Kyle and I am a rising junior at Amherst College who has had the great privilege of being a mentor or big for Big Brothers Big Sisters for almost a year now. My mentee or little and I were matched this past September at the height of the pandemic. I wasn't sure how well my match would work out virtually, but my little and I have been able to build a strong friendship that has helped sustain me during these difficult times. Over the past nine months or so, I've learned that there's nothing more enjoyable and rewarding than getting to spend time with a fun, loving, energetic, and thoughtful nine-year-old once a week. Every week, my little's positivity and energy lifts my spirits, inspiring me to be a similarly positive and energetic presence in the lives of those around me. I also have a hunch that my consistent caring presence and eagerness to indulge my little's love of fort building, TikTok dances, and fashion shows has also helped her feel more supported during this difficult time. This Saturday night, I will be meeting my little in person for the very first time, and I couldn't be more excited to tell her face-to-face -face how much I appreciate her and the connection that we share. News story after news story detailing the millions of children feeling isolated, socially anxious, and unmotivated throughout the pandemic have firmly convinced me that all children now more than ever would benefit from the support of a mentor who consistently shows up for them and deeply cares about their well-being. Every child deserves to look forward to the epic evening that my little and I are going to enjoy together this Saturday and all the weekly virtual chats that preceded it. Every child deserves to forge the kind of connection with a mentor that my little and I share. 
Therefore, I urge you all to support the ongoing efforts made by Big Brothers Big Sisters and other youth organizations to bring the magic of mentorship into many more children's lives. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. All right, and then Jesse, was there anyone else you had mentioned? Um, am I able to speak still? Yes. Okay, great, sorry. Um, so I'm not sure that everyone will, will still need to. I understand that you're trying to keep it brief. Um, so I'm, okay, I'm getting one text about that. So Christina Sharbai was, is one of our staff members and I think she's on. Sure, right, Christina, you can unmute yourself. Hi, I'm Christina Sharbai and I'm a case manager and my work involves um, creating the matches. And what I wanna say is that so much uh, manpower goes into creating those matches and that we have a long list of waiting lists of children and we're, we're recruiting loads of students and people in the community to match them to littles. And by having, um, we're short of case managers um, at this time and by having, and I'm part-time and by having the, the, the work power, the workers power that we need, we can create more matches. There won't be anybody left on a waiting list if we can continue doing this work um, to the capacity that it needs to be done. So that's basically what I want. My perspective of it is the funding helps us to do the work that we have to do. We do wraparound support, not just matches. We, we have to contact every family ev once a month, once a month. We help our families. We even this week took food from the pantry to the families that cannot leave their home because their children are small and they have to be uh, at school and uh, remotely so they can't leave their house. So we do a host of things to support the families. Thank you, Christina. You're welcome. All right, I'm gonna, um, thanks Christina, Ryan and Jesse, I'm gonna mute you and then we'll um, go to the next person. Thank you so much. Sure, thanks. Uh, okay. Hi, Caitlin, you can, um, Unmute yourself. Hi, Nate, and hi to the rest of the committee. Thanks so much um, for having this hearing tonight. Um, I'm Caitlin Marquis with, <clears throat> excuse me, with Healthy Hampshire. Um, here to talk about the Amherst Mobile Market again, but I know that you heard from me very recently, um, and um, I actually have a couple of folks who are here tonight um, representing the Amherst Mobile Market. Um, who work on behalf and volunteer on behalf of the market and on behalf of their communities, um, Marta being one of those who you mentioned, Gail. Um, so yeah, I'd love to just turn it over to Marta Alvarez and Nathan Chung, um, and maybe you could have Marta go first, Nate. All right. Hi, Marta, you can speak, unmute yourself and speak, and then Nathan, you can, I'll give you it in a minute. Good evening, I'm Marta Alvarez. Uh, like I said before, I'm a tenant a volunteer for the farmers market and uh, in my community. And it's been a year that I've been doing that. And it's uh, the tenants, my, my neighbors, they appreciate and they love all the service that the farmers market is giving it to us. And I hear um, a lot of compliments from the, from the group at the farmers market, and they're very happy. And I, I'm glad that we have the privilege and the blessing to receive this work. Great, thanks. Nathan, let me, um, you can unmute yourself too and speak. 
Hi, uh, thank you for having me here. I'm my name is Nathan Chung. I'm an Amherst resident, and uh, I worked last summer as one of the mobile market managers, uh, selling produce and of course setting up the sites. This year, my role changed a little bit. I focus more as the uh, delivery driver. I pick up the produce from different local farms, in addition to the produce uh, we we get from Many Hands Farms, which is the main operator of the Amherst mobile market, and then we I help set up the sites. Um, I think this has just uh, made a lot of emotional difference in the lives of people around the area. The unfortunate thing about Amherst, it's a very large town with not many grocery stores in the area. And the neighborhoods we target tend to be lower income. And also a lot of uh, people of color live in our neighborhoods. We target four different sites. And, uh, um, you know, and they also don't have any like fresh grocery stores nearby. They tend to be uh, flooded with uh, convenience stores that don't sell any fresh food. So I think just having our tent there, even though it's two hours per week at each of the four sites, I think it sort of makes a lot of different statements about what we can do with our community and also what is lacking in our community. So I would really appreciate you supporting us um you know in different ways and uh just you know hope we c i hope we can keep engaging different dialogues and keep improving and keep addressing this interesting issue amherst is facing where um many people would live without cars yet they don't have access to a grocery store nearby so even getting a head of lettuce can be a big hassle so um i thank you for your support and time and uh yeah um, i hope we can move forward thank you Thank you, Nathan. All right, if there are no questions or Caitlin, do you have anything to wrap up with or are you all set? Um, just, yeah, thank you so much. Um, and uh, I know Becky, you've been um, diligently asking about the priorities. So I'll just name, <laughs> um, you know, food and nutrition obviously is a huge priority for us. Um, last year, I was really appreciative to, I mean, sorry, last uh, meeting, I was really appreciative to hear you raise the issue of racial justice um, and how that should perhaps be a priority on this list. That's also a huge priority for us with the Amherst Mobile Market. We have worked really hard to um, support um, folks of color who are um, up against, you know, a lot of disparities in their communities um, to take on leadership positions within the market. You've heard of two, from two of those folks tonight, um, and that continues to be a huge priority for us. So I would really lift that up too um, and would encourage the addition of that priority on this list. Thank you. Thanks. All right, I'm just going to disable talking for, for Caitlin, for you and Nathan and Marta, and then I'll just Go down the list. Let's see. Hi, Lev, you can unmute yourself. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you to the committee for having from um, hearing from all of us. I spoke at the last CDBG hearing that we had about priorities that I was really seeing in Amherst, including temporary housing, shelter, and other supports for people experiencing homelessness, youth development, and family support, and certainly my strong opinion that food and nutrition needs to be a top priority for the upcoming CDBG application project process. I don't want to reiterate my, the comments that I made last time about the really significant ongoing food insecurity need, um, and I, I won't speak specifically to the Amherst Survival Center um, services, but I did want to add a layer in considering these priorities that I would encourage the committee throughout all of these priority areas to seek a strong focus on equity, on racial justice, on accessibility for our diverse com com communities, sorry, and also on quality and impact, whether it's numbers of people served, the depths of services provided and meaningful impact um, have those demonstrated results over time. And, um, while a number of speakers tonight have acknowledged their programs fitting into several different priorities, um, I think to me specifically, it feels like uh, shifting our thinking and making sure that uh, focuses on equity or accessibility or racial justice isn't just a, a separate thing, but something that we're weaving throughout whatever other priorities that we're doing so that we're not upholding harm and perpetuating harmful systems. Um, 
But I, so yes, with that said, I think that this list has some really excellent priorities outlined. Um, and the other comment that I wanted to make was in response to, around the priorities was in response to something that the committee shared at last meeting, which was the possibility of rotating through different priorities on different years, potentially having fewer priorities. Perhaps I misunderstood the comment, but that was what I took from it. Um, and I wanted to respond to that tonight by saying that from a community impact standpoint, I think that having those kinds of rotating priorities or priorities that are rapidly coming on or off the list separate from needs really changing in a meaningful way in the community could result in significant instability in key organizations, which could have the potential, or I think would almost guarantee reducing the impact of those programs. Um, and that I believe a key aspect of social service impact and long-term community change has to do with ongoing presence, relationship building, really meaningful engagement of communities and responsiveness of shifting needs rather than resources coming and going and people not being able to rely on them. Um, so certainly I can say more about details around um, needs regarding food and nutrition, but I feel like I, I covered that last time um, and certainly food and nutrition is, is on that list. So I hope that this was an okay time um, to share some of those other thoughts about the ways that the committee is considering these priorities. Um, thank you so much uh, for your consideration and work on the creation of this RFP. Leb, thanks so much for your input. It was um, nice to hear comments referring to what we discussed at the last meeting and especially around rotating priorities. It's a question we seem to have from year to year and just kind of keep going forth, but having you weigh in as a community member and the director of an organization is very helpful. Um, any questions for Lev? I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for those comments. That was really helpful. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Lev. Right, uh, Jim, you can unmute yourself. Uh, Jim from Amherst Media, are you, do you want to comment or are you? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, great. Thank you. I just had to shut off the air conditioner because you wouldn't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm up in an attic. I want to thank the committee for having this opportunity for the community. Thank you. Um, I've really enjoyed listening to the, the directors and the uh, people involved with so many of the great community uh, organizations in Amherst. Um, my, my point of calling in tonight is I'm trying to get a handle on, on what the priorities are. And I appreciate uh, everyone's intent on looking at those. And so many of them have already been addressed as being interrelated. And, and I totally agree with that. Um, it's not one thing. If you're dealing with a household, you're dealing with youth. If you're dealing with, you know, it's, it's obvious. But it's a difficult uh, situation for everyone with such limited uh, uh, resources. Um, Amherst Media, you know, we've been up in the community now for 45 years as a nonprofit community independent media center. We're the oldest nonprofit access center in the country. And I've been director, executive director for 14 years and never have we applied to a CDBG grant. And because I believe that everyone really needed every dollar that's out there. Um, we'll be submitting an application this year um, because we've lost so much funding, and I'll be honest with you, it's uh, the impact of that has been um, cutting back on our coverage of the public and of the training of our, our youth, the training of our citizens, and, and I, it just can't continue. A lot is demanded of us to cover government, which we do, but our contract also covers, we're supposed to be doing a lot for the community, and we just don't have the finances to do that at the moment. So I'm just making that comment today. Um, I do um, really uh, believe that um, we can be uh, exceptionally helpful. We do a lot for all the organizations that are willing to be helped and, and getting their messages out. But more importantly is that I think there's a lot of families that can benefit from what we're gonna be able to offer. So I just wanted to take this moment to, to uh, let you know that we will be coming in with a, an application. 
And as far as I know that the meeting tonight was specifically supposed to be looking at your um, designated areas of interest. And it's so difficult. It, it really is. Um, I'm just being honest with you and having a long history of being uh, in community organizing and, and it's everything is interrelated and it's only been compounded as we all know. So um, if we can think of any other ways to work, I mean, I'm looking at your, your type of activity and I love the one that says other, please explain. I'm not sure how to do that. So uh, thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you briefly. And I really enjoyed hearing everybody that spoke so far. And um, I look forward to talking to you later. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, questions? Anyone for Jim? I have one. Sorry, Jim. I wonder um, if you what what you would what activity you would put on this list that Amherst Media would fall within. Um, it sort of sounded like you're kicking other please explain back to us, but I think I would ask for, from you whether there's a particular activity or priority that you would ask to have be on this list that would cover what it is that Amherst Media does for the community. Well, um, I thank you for the question. It, it's a combination of youth services, economic self-sufficiency as they exist, which also impacts the household, but I mean, I've been pushing broadband for quite a while and, and municipally owned broadband. Um, that's not what this application will be about, but I think there's a need to educate and those community families that uh, over a hundred families and they had to have uh, hotspots and, and done is that we have to get them trained as a family, as a individuals to, to learn how to utilize that, to be able to access the important aspects of their life, whether it be health, employment. So it's a combination of that. I mean, I don't want to, I, I don't know. It's like splitting hairs, right? It's, it's a common, as I said, everything has kind of interrelated. So I don't have a clear answer to you, but thank you for the question. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jim. I'm gonna, um, this alien you're talking and then we'll keep moving down the list. Um, Kevin, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Nate, and, and uh, thank you for putting a word in the governor's ear about having a Zoom meeting rather than uh, <laughs> come in. It's such a lovely night. I'm sitting out in front of my house, and it's uh, it's nice to be able to, to hear what, as Jim Leskall said, it's nice to be able to hear everyone who's spoken before me uh, talk about the, there are so many needs in our community, and the sad part about that is there's never enough resources to go around, uh, and that's that's always unfortunate. And um, as uh, Laura Reichsman said, that with the eviction moratorium going away, and there there are roughly two thousand evictions in progress right now in Western Massachusetts, and that's that's going to have a huge impact. Not not all of them are individuals; many of them are families as well. Probably the majority are families, but they're still a lot of individuals who are going to be just losing their, their housing. And this is unprecedented. I mean, this, this pandemic is going to result in economic downturn for generations, it seems. Plus, we don't know whether this, uh, this, this pandemic is over. Everybody, everybody seems to think it's, it's done. I, I heard someone say on the radio early on in the pandemic that Americans are built for sprinting, not for marathons. And uh, this is clearly going to be a marathon. So as a result of this pandemic, we had to double our, our output or double our numbers. And uh, we were able to do that in three sites. We were able to uh, rebound from the loss of one site to finding a new site at the Unitarian Universalist Meeting House where we've been able to house 14 individuals. Uh, we then opened a site at uh, the University Lodge where we can house around 20, 22 people. Right now we have 24. Uh, actually 26, sorry, uh, at that site. And because we've had a higher vaccination rate as well, it's been about 50%, which isn't great, but it's certainly better than most. And then we had the uh, Hadley um, Econolodge, which actually, if it's eight o'clock, we're in about eight minutes, we're closing the Hadley Econolodge. 
Um, and that's unfortunate, but that's, you know, with the, with the ending of the state of emergency, uh, we no longer have access to the FEMA dollars, so we cannot bill uh, for those, even though FEMA is still saying to the country that you can still bill for motel rooms until the 30th of September, which is the end of the federal fiscal year. Uh, you know, by the governor's removal of the state of emergency, it makes us ineligible to ask them for, for support in terms of these motels. Um, fortunately, the motel that we have remaining, the University Lodge, we can keep that going through emergency service uh, solutions grant funding uh, through June of 2022. So it's gonna be a shuffle, but uh, right now we've, we're housing about 40 people down you know, now that we're closing the uh, Econ Lodge. And uh, the, other, the other alarming thing for us is that we're looking at as the Unitarian Universalist congregation reconvenes and begins to use its meeting house, we will, there won't be room for us. So we're gonna to have to find a site. We're essentially homeless after the 31st of July in terms of any kind of congregate site. And uh, that's a concern. Uh, Town Manager Buckelman has, uh, has asked a committee to meet. Lev is one of the members of that committee along with myself and others. And uh, Mary Beth Ogilevitz is doing a great job with that. But we're just getting started and we're trying to identify a site. And of course, as usual, the numbers come up as well, how many is, is enough, you know? So we're, we're actively seeking a site for 30 people and uh, that, that has showers, that has space for case management, that has a place to prepare food and a place to, uh, you know, uh, relax in a, in a setting uh, that's that's safe, you know, that's that's socially distanced. Because this, with these variants, we don't we have no idea what we're about to face. We, you know, we'd like to believe that we're done, but you know, done with the pandemic. But uh, you know, it remains to be seen that this Delta variant is going to uh, reach us, and that's that will be a big problem. Um, so, uh, and of course, key to this, getting people through the system and into housing is the case management piece. So we will be asking for help with that in order to get people into housing. And it's of course, a very, very difficult situation when you know, landlords are asking for, for people to be earning in a week what the cost of the rent is. And of course, a one bedroom in Amherst can go for $900 or you know, 875. It's, Kevin, you have one minute. Sure, thank you. Uh, anyway, I don't really have that much more. I just wanted to say that uh, we're going to need your help. And, and, and we thank the committee for, for taking the time. And, and, um, and I guess in anticipation of someone's going to ask me, uh, the first priority household individuals, and then supporting people who are homeless, and then uh, economic self-sufficiency, food and nutrition, health services and transportation are all things that we're working on with our population. And uh, it's a, it's going to be an uphill battle, and as as the uh, as the state of emergency is going to make it more difficult to access resources, also makes it more difficult for people who we serve to get un extended unemployment. Uh, that's gone now. Uh, uh, it's going to be hard. People are going to have a very difficult time in our community. So we appreciate everything that you're willing to do, and uh, we thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, Kevin. Any questions? All right, thanks, Kevin. I'm gonna, uh, let's see. Um, looks like Amherst Community Connections, you have your hand raised again. You have a... Yes, um, thank you so much for the discussion that I wasn't uh, preview on last time because I was away about rotation idea. And that's an idea I have been thinking about for quite a few years in the past ever into the committee about, you know, making this a little bit broader to cover more agencies. And I have three reasons that I would like to support the idea of rotations. And the first reason is that to cover more needs that experience in different sectors. For example, that uh, Jim from the Amherst Media talking about his agency's needs. Normally in the past, we have done a quick study out of the agencies apply your agencies have applied 10 times, get funded 10 times, and your agency, you know, apply 10 times and never been funded. So the constituents are covered by the agency who never get funded, therefore will not be taken care of. So by rotating your grants, 
you might be able to cover, reach out to more people who have needs are not those top five. And the second reason is that contrary to what Lev thought, in my experience that if there's a rotation that five agencies know this is a given year, for example, they will be receiving the grant. So there is the planning ahead of time. Next year, I know, for example, that our agency will not be covered. So therefore, I can go ahead and apply for other fundings because of the anticipation. So therefore, in my experience, there will be more stability contracts contrasting what live uh, experience. So that's my own experience. And the third reason I want to mention, the reason I would prefer the rotation is really it encourages more innovation, creativity, and more willingness to go out, try something different, try something new. And I will not be uncomfortable to talk about the innovation that we have. For every dollar that you give us, $37,000, I calculate it. We reach out to the community. We bring in $7. And those $7, if warm, because the seed money you give, I wouldn't have that innovation to go out, get them. But during the years when your agency, when your uh, funding doesn't come through, I was able to build on those innovative methods. I know how to cover the needs of the population we are working. So therefore the innovation is built into the system because I know we still need to help people who experience housing crisis and we are not willing to give that up. So therefore my method of dealing with that is by being innovative. So I seek out interns in colleges in the area and they are so savvy technology wise. So they are able to meet the constant demand for technology innovation, especially during the pandemic. Everything is done online, everything's done remotely. How do you apply for housing by using uh, the Adobe Reader? Well, I don't know how, but they know how. So that's the innovation part. I feel the rotation system will help to create. So for these three, three reasons, to help more needs being covered and to provide more stability because of the predictability you afford as a rotation. And third, encourage more innovation, creativity. So I would urge the committee to consider the idea of rotating the funding. That way everybody's needs can be met, not just few, five of them every single year. Thank you. Thank you, Weiling. All right, I think it looks like for social services, Gail, there's no other hands raised. The, um, we could move on to non-social services if the committee would like. I'm just gonna share the screen, a new share. The, um, um, you know, so we can, you know, the town is only allowed to fund just for the audience to, um, you know, up to five, a maximum of five social service activities, not just programs or activities in a grant uh, year. Um, and it can only be up to 20% of the application amount. So there's a, you know, a, a, a pretty strict cap on that. The, um, for, for social services or non-social service activities, we have to target to specific areas in, in the town that are also areas where the communities has um, other projects, whether it's um, you know, public infrastructure or where things are happening. So you know, the last few years, can, can everyone see the map of the, of the um, of the community, so the you know the the few areas we've had are the town center outlined in red, the East Amherst Village Center in orange, and then Pomeroy Village Center, which is pretty you know relatively new. And um, I guess that's like purple or magenta. I'm not sure what it looks like. Um, and so that's about you know we I think that's you know we can have two or three target areas at most. I think the state would love it if we only had one, but. Um, so our social, our non-social service priority for the past few years has just been to implement the goals of the master plan in these target areas. And it's been pretty broad in terms of, you know, infrastructure or housing. And, um, you know, that's kind of what, I mean, those are the priorities of DHCD is housing and public infrastructure, uh, you know, and, um, some, you know, some barrier removal, economic development, but you know, I, I think if I, I don't, I'm not, I don't have a comment necessarily. I just wanted to orient everyone to what 
what we look at when we have non-social services. Um, so I guess, you know, Jim, you have your hand raised. Is there anyone else who want to comment on the non-social service piece? All right, Jim, you can um, unmute yourself. Yeah, I had to turn down the air conditioner again. So, um, yeah, I'm not clear on my bird's eye view of the map, but um, so I'm not clear on which districts exist, where the streets are and whatnot. But just one quick, quick uh, comment about your priorities. I went on the state um, site and what was uh, eligible and I noticed that there was an eligibility for public and community facilities. And I'm just putting this out there. It's very obvious that Amherst Media has been trying to build a new facility because of our eviction of our existing location. Um, and I don't know whether you've ever had that as one of your priorities, but um, it would definitely help people like us trying to build a public community facility to get some community development block grant assistance. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there to you. Um, is there any feedback that I should get or I can just leave that as a message to you? No, I think that's a, um, yeah, I don't, I think the committee takes, you know, like we've probably seen in the social services kind of a broader approach to priorities. So when we say public infrastructure, I guess we could say public facilities. It's not, you know, um, so I think that's a good comment. You know, some communities, for instance, are very specific in their priorities. You know, they might just say like paving Main Street. And so it's like, okay, well, we're, we're not only gonna get one proposal to pave Main Street. Um, whereas, you know, we have a, the town has it a little broader and we try to have it based on these uh, target areas. So um, yeah, so I think what you said, um, you know, we could, when we look at, I might just do a new share to show the language. Um, so what we've said is if, 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 if um, you know, community members in the public can see it, we usually say, you know, the goal is to meet the community's master plan in these target areas. So we don't really, we're not, we're, I think, I think it's actually pretty inclusive uh, rather than exclusive. And so what DHCD then does, sorry, just to go down, bear with me for the scrolling, um, they have these categories. So we then define, um, rehabilitation, acquisition, demolition, infrastructure, public facility, which is, so that's there, and then architectural barrier removal. So then these are the categories that they like to see an activity um, be included within. So I think, you know, I, we do have that ability there. Okay. Yeah. Um, if I could just ask, so are you saying that the, that one, the target area does, we are part of the downtown catchment area, if you will? Right, I think, um, you know, Jim, I'd have to look into the eligibility of, you know, I guess we, did, we could, we can discuss more of what Amherst Media would be applying for and how that would be eligible. Um, you know, there's a difference between a social service and a programmatic um, activity and then a physical, you know, oh, building, yeah. and, um, you know, what that means, but as a physical- that's, that's why I'm bringing that up and I'm asking whether that is something that's been either used utilized in the past or being considered this year as it's been, you, it's been you, used in the it's been used in the past but then typically the beneficiaries of the facility have to be a majority lower moderate income so for instance we've used the the block grant money to help fund affordable housing or you know a daycare center where uh, half the uh, participants have been income documented to be lower moderate you know income to be eligible so it has been used in the past it's just a matter of Kind of the details of how it can meet a national objective of the block grant program. Well, I understand that. Yeah. I appreciate that. And, you know, maybe we should pursue that if, to see whether that's a reality in this application or not. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Jimmy. I don't know. I don't see any other hands raised. Um, if that's the case, I guess we could we could close the hearing and then just go on to the public meeting to discuss what we've heard tonight in the previous meeting and then you know go over the request for proposals. If that's if that's what the committee would like to do. I'm just going to share the agenda again just so everyone can see. We have the 
you know, discuss priorities and then target areas and then the public meeting piece. So I don't. Do we need a motion to close the public hearing? We would, yes. Would anybody like to make a motion to close? I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. I will second, second the motion. Then the vote has to be by roll call since it's through Zoom. So yeah, you just want to call out the members and we can. Okay. Uh, all present and accounted for are, Becky, are you here? Yes. Rika Clement, are you here? Yes. Matt Larson? I am. Lucas Hanscom? Yep. Yes, I am. I am here. And so all, would all five of you like to close the hearing? I guess that's the... Yes. yes. All in favor. Yes. <laughs> any right. any discussion or anybody opposed? <gasps> All right. Great. So I think you know for the committee, you know I don't know if you want to, if it's easier to start with the non-social service <laughs> if, at, if there's not as much of discussion or or say, you know what you want to what you'd like to do first. Um, you know I didn't get any comments. I think previously so there had been a few comments about the documents and I think those were try to be incorporated. So I didn't really get too many comments in terms of what to change. I think, you know, my thought listening tonight, um, you know, what Lev said about, uh, so I was gonna, I know it's like um, the accessibility of programs and the impact and the equity piece, you know, there is a criteria about impact. And so we could, we could add, you know, the racial equity piece or, you know, something about, you know, having in that description, you know, what, how the, how the organization, how the impact, you know, meets that one piece. Um, and so as opposed to having it be a separate um, priority, it becomes part of the review criteria. So, you know, it becomes something different, you know, you know, it gets interwoven that way as opposed to being its own priority. So that, that was something I was thinking when Lev was speaking. So I'm sorry, Nate, are you talking about the non-social service or the social service right now? Uh, it could be both, you okay. know, so I think that, um, let me just, if we uh, go back to the social services, so I'm just gonna, uh, just gonna scroll a little bit. So when we ask, you know, so these, you know, all these categories are a local decision. And then also a lot of this mimics what we have to submit to the state, you know, so they, they review proposals based on this information. And so we have a product description, need uh, community involvement and support, Feasibility is a big one, and then impact. So my thought is under this impact or one of these, we could write, we could we could ask the question about, you know, how does the program, how is the program accessible to, you know, we can say diverse populations or something, and what and how. Um, I'm just trying to see what we actually say. Um, you know, we could say how does it advance equity. You know, so I I mean, I'm just throwing that out there as a possibility if for the committee. I, I was just thinking that when Lev was saying that about how to make it integral to a, every proposal. I guess I would I would advocate um, for listing it as a separate type of activity just to show it can be a standalone activity and to emphasize you know, the importance of it. Um, and just looking at the various categories that we have in the ranking criteria, they're all very, you know, kind of neutral with respect to any of the types of activities. So I'm not sure it'd be that helpful to add a ranking criteria item that is, you know, more of a, you know, substantive goal as opposed to more of a kind of a neutral ranking of the project that, you know, meets the goal. Excuse me, uh, is it possible to, um not screen share so we can see each other. Oh yeah, I can stop sharing if that's possible. Okay. I just find it difficult. Yeah. I oh, no, I, I, I would um I would prefer to have it be um a criteria by which all um agencies that all agencies speak to um the racial equity because I believe it should be integrated into what we're doing in in all parts of our life as opposed to a standalone. So I, I like your proposal, Nate. I think it could actually be both. I mean, we could add it as a type of activity 
so that if there's an organization that specifically does that, it's there. And then we also, I agree, Rika, that it should be in every application should address it. And so it should be in that list under so, impact. So no, so as opposed to coming under impact, it would be its own item to be as part of the application. I'm talking about as the application process. As a priority, we're saying now then it would be a priority as oh, going a, back a, to priority. Priority. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And possibly a, a criteria review criteria. I think that's a, a discussion the committee can have. Um, you know, it seems like most of the categories we have people spoke to. So, you know, I don't, you know, I think uh, Rika, there was one that we did mention at the last meeting, which may have been, um, I was going to ha have another, <laughs> I have a lot of documents open, but one was, um, I think it was just like social services in general, or I, I forget how you worded it. I you had mentioned, I wrote it down, it was mental health services. Yeah, mental health services. At, at the last meeting, a couple of different people talked about mental health services, particularly for children. Right. But nobody raised it tonight, so maybe, I mean, I don't right. know. You know, and then also, like, I'm not sure that anybody raised health services and insurance navigation tonight as a, an, a topic, so I don't know whether we take that off for the year, you know, or if it still seems. But I think Wayling sort of mentioned health services. I mean, I think kind of what Amos Community Connections does. Okay. They talked about wrap, wrap around. Yeah, I mean, this is like a multiple choice uh, quiz. And so usually in, when we submit an application, we can only select one. Um, you know, they might be able to select many for the town, but when we submit to the state, it can only be one, you know? So for instance, um, you know, like uh, Amherst Community Connections, I think the state, they have a category that says support service for homeless. And, you know, whether or not it has other pieces, you know, they, they'll try to identify what they think it is too. So sometimes there's a back and forth over when the town applies and what they want to categorize an activity as. So I think the, what's nice about having them at least for locally, it helps the committee decide when we're reviewing proposals, okay, you know, are we hitting a number of priorities if we want to and how, how you know, how does the agency categorize uh, the proposal? So um, yeah, I think the health service director actually at one point talked, spoke with me and said that the health navigation is still a really big issue, you know, and with the new Sandy health center kind of, that's a, you know, one of the reasons it came to town, but I feel like with the other category, we're not closing the door on someone. I guess the question is, you know, do, would we elevate, say, for instance, like racial equity or advancing equity as a priority just to call it out, um, you know, just so that it's, people can be aware of it as something that's available. Um, I think that's what was, you know, discussed last time. I think it should be added. Do we have to have a majority vote to add it or it's just a well, maybe we should talk about what exactly it would be. I mean, right. whether it's advancing equity or addressing racial disparities or just racial justice as a topic. I mean, I think there are so many different ways of phrasing it. Um, right. I would, I would think as, as broad as, as possible because right. you never know what kind of proposals might come in. So just you know, simply racial equity and justice would be a very you know, big tent. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I guess that I, I, we don't necessarily have to have a vote, but if we think racial equity and justice is kind of an agreement by consensus, is nod your head. <laughs> yeah. Just right. to clarify for the uh, notes and minutes, is this for a new? Um, Activity or priority activity, or for a, a review criteria? Type of activity. Activity. Activity, okay. and then I think we'll talk about review criteria separately. <clears throat> right. I guess we're on the social service, uh, social service proposal. So that's you know, so we'd add, we've added one, um, one um, priority. You know, I was looking at the state guidelines today, and what I usually like to do is try to update. The request for proposals to align with their criteria. So you know they they put out their one year plan pretty recently, and they have I haven't done a uh, exact comparison, but I just want to make sure that what we have in there under say feasibility is a big one for them lately, just because I think a lot of grants um, need extensions, and they're trying to really mix, stick to a twelve to eighteen month implementation period. You know, so I may change some of those individual questions under feasibility just to make sure we're 
in line with what the state's asking. So, I, you know, I didn't do that for tonight. I look quickly and it seems like they're, they're the same. I just want to make sure we're not missing anything. So there may be like an administrative thing that Ben and I do just to make sure we're capturing everything the state wants, just so we're not, you know, we don't have to ask an applicant after the fact. Can I bring up, um, is there, I mean, when I read household family and individual stabil stabilization, I mean, everybody's talking about housing, 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 and I'm not sure household stabilization could be, a, could right. fall, a lot of things could fall under that. And I'm proposing we call it housing stabilization and then put the, put the parentheses after the word stabilization, family and individual. I just think it feels more to the point. And I think household, I don't know. I feel like it's kind of redundant the way, I just don't think it's clear enough the way that it is now. And I think we could just tweak it just a tiny bit to make it um, clearer. Right, so it, would say, it would say housing stabilization, then parenthetically, uh, how family and individual or something, right? That, yeah. yeah, I think that was a really good point that you made, Gail about the homelessness. So the, the other, um, what I liked about, about household stabilization, I was trying to figure out where housing goes in there too. Um, but I guess my concern is that just to take family outreach, for example, when Laura is talking about all the things that they do, yes, housing is a very, very big part of it, but there's so much else that they do, whether it's like helping kids with like homework or other types of you know, services, social services. Um, so there's a lot that's not housing and I would not like to leave that out by just mentioning housing. Good point. I mean, maybe addressing issues of houselessness is its own category. Or we do have, we do have yeah, I was curious about that. Just that whether addressing homelessness and how and just providing housing are the, I mean, they seem to overlap, you know. So wait, a so adding homelessness or houselessness as a, as a separate priority and, is, and continuing is, to have household stabilization. But it is there. It is there. It's the second one. Yeah, Support yeah. services for those experiencing homelessness. It comes right under household stabilization. Yeah. And so so why do we feel like, like so what's missing? Housing stabilization and then housing. housing yeah. Sorry, homelessness, housing, home, housing stabilization. Say, say it again, please, Lucas. So I, I see it's almost like a flow chart. Homelessness, housing stabilization, or how, finding housing, then housing stabilization. That's, you know, sort of the flow into from, you know, a tent into an apartment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, I don't know, but it just seems like that's all connected. And, I guess I don't read support services for those experiencing homelessness as housing. Like that, it, that seems like it's a very, and it's a very distinct piece of the work that organizations do. I mean, maybe it's enough all semantics that every organization has obviously been able to apply in the past and figure out how to make it work. So it may not be necessary I mean, it that we seems like the solution into it, but homelessness is housing. Right, isn't that sort of what you're trying to do generally when dealing with somebody who's homeless is find somewhere. I mean, there's, you know, making sure they're fed and getting mental health care and health care and all that. But I mean, eventually that's sort of what the, the idea is, right? I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm missing something. Lev has offered to um, weigh yeah. in. So we're gonna let her, um, we're gonna unmute her. Sure, yeah, Lev. I, yeah, I was gonna say quickly, I think that that's your question. I don't know if it is semantics, the difference between household and housing stabilization. I feel like, you know, we're not, I feel like we wouldn't be um, excluding something. Like, I, I feel like family outreach could say that they're under housing stabilization and offer, I guess that's how narrowly you define housing stabilization. Is it just specifically, you know, a mortgage support or is it everything that goes into keeping someone housed? And so I, I, I tend to think the latter. So, um, but Lev, you can speak and uh, thanks for offering. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. I just wanted to, there's a couple of layers that you're sort of referring to. And so I think that um, housing stabilization generally refers to either providing housing for someone who is currently homeless, or it's an umbrella that it also refers to something that essentially keeps someone housed. So stabilizing their housing. When we think of 
um, support services for individuals experiencing homelessness, that's, or families, that's referring to like the other wraparound things that uh, Mr. Hanscom, you were just referring to, like the medical care and mental health support and transportation and help getting access to documents and all those other things. Those tend to be what, like, sort of within supportive services, we refer to as support services for someone who's already experiencing homelessness. And then I think family stabilization, um, family or individual stabilization is a much broader array of things. That's where all of the things that you were just talking about um, that Family Outreach of Amherst does in addition to housing stabilization could fit. Um, so I think I would actually agree that the two Clearly, organizations have figured out good ways to check the boxes and make it work. But in terms of uh, Ms. Lansky, what you were just getting at and kind of honing in on the housing piece, I guess from my sort of service standpoint, I would say that that isn't particularly well identified with those two pieces, um, though obviously organizations have found ways to, to put it in. So anyway, hope that's helpful. Thanks. It is helpful. Um, hmm. Well, maybe adding housing stabilization as a category then fixes that. Does it make us have too many priorities? Um, That's a lot. Nate? Um, I, mean, I, I think if we chose or we changed house, household, household stabilization said housing stabilization. Um, and then, you know, we could say parenthetically family or individual. I think, I think that's fine. I, I think that you know, for instance, I think, you know, Laura is not here, but I think family outreach or others could still figure out, I think, you know, like, I think there's a number of categories or priorities or activities they still would be able to, um, to meet or, you know, to, to say they are. And I think then it becomes, um, yeah, so I, I don't, I don't, I think that's fine. I feel like if we add too many more, it just, it, you know, we could, because we can only fund, fund five activities and then we have to narrow it down with the state, I think, I think these categories are helpful for the community and the committee to understand, you know, how to review proposals, right? So we said before in the past, like, what if we have five proposals that are all under food and nutrition, then it might help say, okay, you know, how do we review those comparatively? If we have, you know, a number that are doing the same thing, it, it, it helps. Um, I mean, we could add another one. I just, I, I mean, I, I I feel like, you know, economic self-sufficiency there, you know, there's a number, there's a few categories that, that you know, a wraparound service services could could say they do. So I don't. Yeah, I, I mean, my inclination would. I'm generally a joiner. I tend to group things, um, just personally. So I would I would generally try to put things as homelessness and and housing as one, one one general umbrella item. But again, I'm new, so I don't. Know. Yeah, yeah, I don't see I don't see how that's a detriment. I mean, we're if if we if we have the categories as we said earlier be broad and inclusive health as opposed to pinpointing health. things. And I just want to throw it out there just just for discussion. I mean, support services for seniors, do we have anybody who's spoken to that at all tonight anything that can fall under that and then you take one off the table for this year and then if we add one it feels like we're still maintaining the same number hmm. and i think i would almost say that like transportation and the health services insurance piece like those are all part of the wraparound services so if we start defining it as what a person who's experiencing homelessness needs is are all those things that are listed more toward the bottom um, but also specific housing stabilization. So, mm -hmm. and then, so, I mean, I think you could get rid of some of the more detailed ones or the more specific ones because they're going to be included in these other areas of support services. And so if household stabilization, household, and fam household stabilization, comma, family and individual is going to include seniors as well as a family right and then it just makes everything that much broader i agree yeah that makes sense and we still have the other category so we're right not, we're not we're not intentionally excluding any any um program or any nonprofit from applying because we always have other 
Right, so, so what I've heard so far is we're adding a category, racial equity and justice. We would change household stabilization to read housing stabilization, you know, and then you know, a parenthetical family and individual and possibly eliminating the health services, uh, support services for seniors and transportation. Those are the bottom three because they're somewhat, um, you know, they're done with some of the other services. They're kind of folded into the other services we've, is that, we can, you can do that. Is that, is that fair, a fair, is that? A good I think summary? that's right, but I think we still need the category of of um, household or family stabilization. I get it. I think we're we're not deleting that entirely. I mean, Love was making that distinction between housing. Yeah, and I, just think, I, I mean, I guess some of it would be how how detailed are we getting? You know, like I, I kind of understand the difference, but I think I think if we're going to do that, then I feel like we'd want to change. You know, they both are so similar. So I'm going to say, really, what's the difference between housing stabilization and household stabilization? I mean, is it semantics or is it? If we, so, I would want to clarify one of the terms or- I thought know. what Lev just did was sort of clarify that, right? Like my understanding of what she just said was housing is right. literal housing, right? And providing housing or keeping a person housed is housing stabilization. And then the support services are the things that we're getting rid of at the bottom. And then there's also family stabilization, which you could also call household stabilization. That is for a family where maybe housing isn't the issue, but it's all the other supports like the family outreach provides. That was my understanding of that. Yeah, I just feel like there's most organizations I think probably overlap a little bit. You know, I feel like if you're helping someone with other things, even though it's not directly say a housing piece, it keeps them in their housing, right? Because if, if they're, if it helps them with employment or certain things and it, it has the additional benefit of helping them stay in there, stay housed. I just seems really amalgamous. I think it's right. defined. It's uh, like, is it food and nutrition? Is it mental health? Is it healthcare? Is it? Okay, yeah, so Lev suggested in the chat having what, the category household stabilization, parenthetically, including housing, stabilization, family, and individual. So it becomes you know, still one category. It's pretty include. It's pretty broad that way. I think that works. That's yeah, right. I think that works. Yeah. Okay. That way we're not, I, I, yeah, that way we're not splitting hairs and some agency's not confused as to what. Yeah. It's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Would you have a semicolon after housing stabilization, including housing stabilization, semicolon, family and individual? I think, I think semicolon, then maybe just, I think the commas or semicolon. Family, including household stabilization, including housing stabilization, semicolon, family and individual. Yeah. Are there any grammarians out there that would like to weigh in on that? <laughs> I'm not a grammarian. I'm a violator. The family and individual doesn't just apply to housing, it applies to the household, right? Right. So I think it would be including housing stabilization, comma, family, comma, and individual. Okay, so comma after family. Right. The Oxford okay. comma. Yes, I believe strongly in the Oxford comma. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Lev, for that. That's really helpful. Uh, yeah, that sounds good. And then, um, you know, and then, so if I'm just going to walk through the proposal, you know, they have to meet a national objective and be consistent with community priorities. So they describe that. Um, we asked for a project budget. Uh, in the last fall, we we um, tweak the language and try to be a little bit more um, specific about what we're asking. So I'm, you know, I think that is helpful. And we also have a chance, we did this last year, I think for the first time that the committee would send questions in to staff and then we would ask applicants to respond. So there's this two week period where, um, you know, it puts a lot of work on the committee to review proposals and then get questions to staff and then before we, the committee meets to review proposals, we'd have applicants answer some clarifying questions. So I think that was actually a really helpful step last year. Um, you know, project description is something that, um, you know, it's pretty straightforward, the project need, community involvement and support, and then project feasibility has like a number of sub points and that's a, a big one for the state. And then we have project impact. And so I think, 
that's the review criteria. I just want to make sure that, you know, are we still thinking about adding something um, in project impact or, you know, changing any of those? Is there something else we think we may want to add? Well, and along the lines of the racial equity and justice accessibility? Yeah, that or if there were, you know, if, if, if committee members looked at uh, the documents and just had some other questions or comments in general. I think it could be useful to put something in that project impact list of bullet points. I mean, there's a general question, what would be the impact of the proposed project program, but we could add something like how, how will the proposed project program affect you know, racial equity and justice, for example? Right, we could just leave it kind of broad and... Yeah, I'd like to see that in that um, section. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, is it, we like what Nat said, just something, a kind of a broad question that you know, any, anyone making a proposal can respond to, they can, you know, tailor their response. So Caitlin just posted that she's requesting if there's, if it's possible to remove some of the bullet points from the application, given the short number, the small number of pages. Um, yeah, I think that's just the uh, reality. Um, most of, so yeah, I, I don't, there's not much room to, uh, like I said, usually we try to go, you know, I think, you know, the, what is it like five major categories that the committee looks at, you know, and then there's all these sub questions. So I don't think there's too much, um, uh, I can look again, but I really do think that uh, we can see if, if any of these need to come out of the three page limit, but that's, I mean, this is kind of what we, uh, what the town needs to then in turn supply to the state in three pages. I feel like there's not too much to take out. I know what Caitlin's saying. It is a lot to pack in there. We're not asking for more pages though. <laughs> are, we, are, you, are you just asking or, or, or uh dictating Nate? <laughs> well, no, I, I think that up to this point, we're pretty consistent on the number of pages that we ask for and that we limit applications to. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, I think it's hard because the state does ask all these questions, all these questions. <laughs> um, there may, you know, I'll, I'll, like I said, Ben and I can look again. And for instance, if, if some of these, some of these parts of these categories are not, uh, the state hasn't, put their formal application on. That's the hard part yet. Um, but we can, I can look at last year's and we can just verify. So if, you know, for instance, if part of project need or something doesn't need to be within the three page limit, we'll, we'll pull it out uh, in RFP or make it clear that that part is not part of the three page limit. So I think that's something we can do, you know, before this goes live. You know, I wonder can, if the, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I think that's something we can do. I, I think, the difficulty is, um, you know, the state has changed their application a little bit last year, but like I said, those categories, that's, I mean, that's really what they have the town fill out when we then in turn apply. You know, they ask product feasibility, product description, product impact, and we have to then write to all those points within three pages ourselves. So it's not, you know, I think, yeah. What were we gonna say back to you? Oh, I was gonna <clears throat> say that, um, that maybe the, the piece about, addressing racial disparities and um, accessibility for diverse communities could go in the section where we ask for a demonstration of consistency with community priorities rather than project impact. Which I guess is section A. 6A. I don't know what. Oh, I see what you're saying. So, right, put put that put that piece in uh, there instead of in. I think that makes sense if we're if we, mm -hmm. now that we added um, racial equity and justice as a priority, it makes sense to 
have follow through with the description. Yeah, I, I think that's a good idea. And it also then takes it out of the three page limit. So, it, um, you know, and then when we answer that, it really is a part of the, that, that, yep. I'm okay with that. I think it's, and it will help an agency so they don't have to try to explain too much in a short, short number of pages. Mm -hmm. Is everybody else okay with that? Sounds good. Yeah, you have wanted it under impact. Right, I, I may have um, removing something then from H to A. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think you know A is consistency with community priorities, and so I think if we have this as a priority, we could have this be one of the sub bullets under A, and then it's also not part of the three page limit. So we're not asking an agency to spend. You know, they can oh. explain. They can they can describe it. Just it's not then part of the three page limit. All right, well, okay, so instead of putting it in H, we're putting it in A. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yep, that's great. Yep. Great. Yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I think Ben and I will just look to make sure. So for instance, like if product impact this year isn't part of the three page limit in the state, we can just put it, we can reorder this just so then it's, you know, just to make sure we're not, you know, we give agencies enough room. Um, I think uh, if, there aren't, if there aren't any other questions about the social service priority, I think, um, we can go on to the non-social service one. So I have, I have one suggestion for the list of type of activity. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, I remember being confused last year when we had the application for, and we ended up funding the Valley CDC for the, um, micro enterprise assistance program uh, because we don't have economic development on this list of type of activity is this is this for social service not or non-social service no non non-social service non social service yeah so is there some reason we shouldn't add economic development to the list of activities yeah that actually probably is a good one um And maybe I'd say economic development and then tech slash technical assistance, which is um, something like that. Is that fair? Oh, uh, you know, I, I just want to make sure that. Yeah, as long as, as long as that's part of what the state will allow for non-social service. They will. Yeah, it's ironic, but that type if it's under economic development, um, then it isn't a social service. <laughs> it's actually considered a non-social service right yeah so i didn't know that before last year <laughs> i didn't either actually the state had <laughs> they had an it's actually it's a it's a um they have like 10 or 11 categories of activities and this is like economic development is considered um um like part of a, a category five and they they haven't really funded those a lot and so with covid though it became a bigger priority and so when we applied i they were like just you know, they were like, oh, wow, we don't have it. They didn't even have it in their system to say what activity it was. Um, they hadn't, they hadn't funded it in so many years. So um, I think a lot of communities were surprised. <laughs> All right, and then what do we think about the target areas? You know, there's the three, they're pretty big. Um, you know, I think we can explain that there are areas that the town is putting other resources into you know, into those areas in terms of public infrastructure, new sidewalks or utilities or intersection work. And it have, they have to be consistent with the master plan, the target areas? No, I think what we're trying to say with that is that the, um, the activities that would be funded would be consistent with the mass, the town's master plan. Um, but then the activities come to the target areas. So isn't that sort of saying the same thing? Yeah, so I think we would say um, we change this to uh, we'd add economic development here, like Nat suggested. If that's if I'm sharing that, and then for the priority, maybe I go page. Sorry, I just, where am I? I? Lost my. Uh, yeah, so here we are, right here. Yeah, what, sorry, Gail, what were you saying? 
that we don't have much leeway with the target areas because aren't the target areas consider aren't we considering the target areas as part of what the town's master plan is working on? And you said no, the projects have to be according to the town's master plan. But isn't that kind of like a two-way relationship? Two-way street? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I guess a little bit. Um yeah, I mean, I think the I think the bigger reality is that all the non-social service activities have to be within a target area. So I think that's the, you know, that's kind of the biggest restriction um, for that piece. So, you know, for instance, if so, you know, I think I know what you're saying. I just I think it's harder. I was trying to I'm trying to think of a way to explain it because you know I think we've had it we've had the instance where someone said oh I'd like to do a project in North Amherst and we're like well that's not in a target area and it's almost categorically excluded because of that. Um, so I don't, know if, I don't know if you like this language here to continue meeting the goals of the community's master plan and community priorities. Is that, you know, does that, is that broad enough? And then we have the activities below, you know, we have like the five activities like acquisition, demolition, economic development that they, that an agency will check off. In terms of the, um, the three, area the target areas right those were selected whenever that i don't know how long those have been the selected right. areas does anything change it so that one of them shouldn't be there anymore or that some other area should be yeah i think the um you know at one point north amherst was for a number of years and we used block rent money up there to do a few things and so then it you know it, it came off the uh came off as a target area um you know, the green is representing, it may need to be updated. Uh, the new census data isn't quite available, but the green is showing income eligible block groups. So where a majority of the population is lower moderate income. Um, so I think, you know, the Pomeroy village is actually a newer one. You know, the town's been doing work. We did East Hadley Road and then Groff Park, and we're looking at the intersection down here and with the town looking at purchasing Hickory Ridge. So this is kind of a, you know, a new one uh, East Amherst has been on there for a little bit, but we're still trying to do work. The town just acquired property there to put in affordable housing and there's a few infrastructure projects. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think in terms of, uh, I was also gonna say that if if there are a few proposals that come in and um, the committee, you know, we, were, we hold a second public hearing to review recommendations and let the public know at the end of August and it's uh, because it's a public hearing, we could also then vote to change a target area. <laughs> it's kind of like the chicken and egg thing, but so for instance, what if what if we uh, there's a few proposals and say, wow, North Amherst really needs to be a target area again, then the committee could vote to change and make North Amherst a target area and remove, say for instance, East Amherst if nothing came in for that area. So or this year that would could be implemented yeah. right away. Right, so I think, I think for now the target areas are fine, you know, um, you know, and I think, you know, some of it's what staff has, um, you know, what we know what the town is doing and if, you know, the committee or anyone has any, um, any ideas, but I don't, so for instance, like in town, in the town center, it goes north quite a bit because that captures Olympia Oaks. And a few years ago, you know, we funded Olympia Oaks when it was under construction and we, you know, we end up making these target areas pretty big geographically. So we can always do that too. We can expand a target area boundary if we need to, to capture something, if it's just outside. Um, you know, I think they're, I think they're pretty good. They kind of align with the village centers and the master plan as well. So we have, you know, seven village centers in town. Um, mm -hmm. But back to your point, it could be right, right. In a few years, what if Cushman up here, if everyone can see where my cursor is, you know, what if all of a sudden the town's spending money up there and we're like, okay, there's gonna be some new housing and there's a lot going on, you know, Cushman could become a target area. Right. Right. But for now, I don't, I don't right. think. I think then we should maybe stick with what we've got, particularly given that we had some proposals last time around, which clearly didn't get funded because we didn't do funding. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I would, whether it's voting or just suggesting that we just keep them as is. Okay. I agree. Yeah, they seem consistent with what we've heard tonight and, and the past proposals. So yeah, they look good to me. All right. All right, and if we're, if we're okay with the request for proposals themselves, I guess we could just go through the schedule um, 
I mean, so, you know, embedded in that review and the proposals are the review criteria. So it seems like we're okay with that as well then, you know, those categories impact feasibility and everything. Um, you know, I think at some point we talk about, you know, rotating priorities that what we've just discussed tonight or weighting, you know, priority. So somehow when we're reviewing proposals, there may, you know, different criteria might have different weights. And I think, you know, that happens, and I think individually, community, you know, committee members will kind of place different importance on things as they're making their comparative criteria. So every year, almost every year, the committee kind of discusses, you know, do we do something different with how we review proposals? So, you know, we have our little matrix with the proposals and then the, you know, seven criteria and do we want to do any type of weighting or something different? And so I just, you know, that can be part of the discussion. I guess I, I, I see that there are views on both sides. I guess the, the one sort of major structural issue I see with trying to have a, a specific rotation is that one of the requirements is that this be a new activity, you know, any proposal be a new activity or a continuation of an old activity. Right. So if you know, one of the major categories is to continue activities, so to say, for example, the you know, food pantry at the survival center, if we have a rotation that, you know, one year food is not a priority and we have decided in advance we're not going to give to a food proposal then that we're not able to continue that activity anymore right. so just as as part of the, the process that we go through that seems it would really um kind of you know be an impediment to um you know trying to continue you know existing successful you know programs whatever they are and I think that's what Lev was saying. She said, you know, an ongoing presence is important. And she spoke about not advocating for rotating priorities. Yeah, I was intrigued by what Wayling was saying, but I, I also think that it's something that should that requires more thought and, and a, a lot of, I mean, the, I guess my biggest thought around it was not in a year when there's been a pandemic. Like this is, the, just not the year to sort of try figuring out what those priority areas should be and ex automatically excluding anything. Yeah, I, I was impressed with Wayland's willingness to be innovative and look for other sources of funding and, you know, ultimately her comment about it being a more stable funding when you've got more diverse sources. But yeah, this doesn't seem the moment to do that. Totally agree. Yeah, I think the, um, you know, because we asked for a documented need and proposals, um, you know, I think that helps agencies make the claim that, you know, um, and, you know, they can sh illustrate that the need's not going away. So, you know, for instance, like, I don't think we've like, you know, um, we've paid our way out of food security yet, you know, so it's like maybe right. at some point, like if we are no longer, <clears throat> no longer have food insecurity, we say, okay, that's not a priority, but I, I feel like we haven't, we haven't done that. And so the state doesn't require us to rotate priorities or weight them differently. You know, the Amherst is a mini entitlement because of our documented need, um, low income population and a few metrics. So I think that, yeah, it is interesting. I, I think, um, I agree with Matt. There is a, I think uh, actually, if we don't fund an agency for one year, it, it could, I think it could be difficult then for them to get back in the, into the cycle just because the way f our funding doesn't overlap the local fiscal years very well. Um, you know, so I think an agency, there could be some trouble there. Um, the innovation is interesting. I, I guess my only thought though is, you know, we also have a capacity question in block grant program does want to know that a community agency can meet all these requirements. So, I mean, there's a, you know, quite a bit to follow up with, you know, an agency has to do income verifications and reporting. And so, I don't think innovation is a bad thing. I just, I'm not sure the block grant program has kept up with <laughs> how fast agencies can change. So, you know, they're not, you know, I, you know, even in terms of their um, infrastructure programs, you know, they're still like housing and roadways, which isn't necessarily the same as what some agencies might do or what we think is as, as non social service, but you know, the program regulations are still quite old. And so, you know, if they, if they get updated and are more flexible, I, I would be willing to change that. But for now, I, yeah. I think it could be something that is worthwhile to consider for future years, but maybe not this year. Great. Is everybody uh, in agreement with, with um, Nate? Oh yeah. Yes. I think this is the right year to change things. 
Oh yeah. So when we review proposals, you know, each committee member, I think what we what we had done in the past was, um, what we'll do this year is, you know, we have our review matrix, and then each committee member would, for instance, if there's five non-social service proposals, would provide, you know, first we have the questions that would go to the applicants if there are any, and then they would respond. And then the committee meets and reviews proposals and comes up with a general ranking. And during that meeting, before that meeting, committee members would send me their, their order of non-social service and social service well, in and Ben priority. So you would, you would individually rank, you know, from one to five or one to 10, whatever the order is, and then staff comes up with a composite ranking. Uh, and then that's the basis for discussion. And so uh, what happens there is then, you know, individuals have already kind of determined what they think are the stronger proposals based on all the comparative criteria. And sometimes, you know, a few agencies are clear, you know, clearly have the top few votes. And then, you know, then there's a discussion about how to fund the remainder. And does that seem like that, you know, that works? I think they're, you know, Nat, you were here and Gail, I'm not sure if the new members, since we didn't really do that, but um, does that seem like it work, has been working? <clears throat> yeah, I think it's worked. I think it's it's worked pretty well. Um, in particular, yeah. So I think we've we've ranked kind of one through four, and then you've aggregated everything, and then um, that's important. But really, the most important thing is then discussing because um, you know things may come up. So even even if let's say there are two very highly ranked proposals, but they're kind of doing the same thing. We don't necessarily want to fund those if there's not enough money to fund some of the other things. So, um, but just as an initial step, you know, having the, um, the rankings and kind of seeing what other people thought about um, the various proposals and how they were ranked, I think that's worked really well. All right. I think we kind of have a system too for like looking at what's on the far right, what's on the far left, and then figuring out like, you know, what do we do with the middles? Like we can get rid of the low scores, get rid, you know, we, we advocate for the high scores. And then it's the middle, it's that middle ground that we're always kind of stuck with, but we seem to work it out. Right. All right. So I think, you know, for me that I, if, unless there's any other changes to the request for proposals, I feel like um, we've had a few comments on both of them. I, I think I, I have them, Ben. Are you comfortable with that? And I would just go then on to, it's almost nine o'clock. We could just go on to the next, the schedule, the meeting dates and everything and just see um, how that works. So, you know, there is a training tomorrow just for staff, for municipal staff with DHCD on the block grant program. So, you know, I don't think we're ahead of the game, but, you know, if there's anything that they say tomorrow that needs to change what we need to do, I'll email the committee. Um, you know, I feel like they're always throwing, sometimes putting new things out there. So I was going to just share a screen, just, you know, I, I had emailed with proposed dates. I just want to, we can just go over those to make sure that's feasible. And, um, you know, I think today's the 16th. So the idea would be to try to get the request for proposals issued by Friday, on Friday, you know, by Friday, you know, it's a holiday, but I don't mind just getting them online and emailing them out. So, you know, we have a day, day and a half to finalize those documents and get those out. Um, and then, you know, I just I just had these dates down. You know, uh, they're due on the 18th, so it's plenty of time, especially with the holiday. For I'm hoping for agencies to get proposals in. Committee would have questions to staff by August 6th, so it's kind of a quick turnaround for a committee to do a, a review of proposals and have um, questions. Um, the app we would get those to if we if committee had questions to us by like Friday at noon, we could get those to the applicants by close of day Friday. And then they would have applicants would have until August 12th to um, respond. And then we would have a public meeting on August 17th, which I think is a Tuesday. And at that public meeting, that would be when the proposals would be, you know, the committee would come up with the draft recommendations to the town manager. And then um, a week and a half later, we'd have a public hearing. And, you know, at that date, we'd actually have. Uh, you know, we could have discussed this with the town manager's office and then allow the public to comment on the recommended activities. And then the, um, the applications are due by, by September 10th. So it doesn't give too much turnaround time for staff, but you know, I think that works within the time frame. So 
does that are those I guess the important thing now that uh, since we have five members, you know, does the end of July to August 6th work for committee members to review those proposals and generate questions and then you know August 16th, 17th and 26th, you know, we could move dates, you know, a few days here and there, but not by like a week or two. But if we think the 17th and 26th are generally good at this time, we could just keep those and then you know, if we need to change as we get closer, um, we could, but does that kind of work? That works for me. Sounds fine. Yeah. I guess yeah, I, I think it's fine. I do have a question. If we go to in-person meetings, would there be a hybrid opportunity for those of us who couldn't be at the meeting? So I think, you know, because of the extension that was signed, yeah. where um, the town manager said that at least in, uh, in, through September or into September, all meetings will be through Zoom or remote. So I think this whole schedule is gonna be remote. And so there's not gonna be any in-person or um, hybrid at this time. I think actually the, the I think it was December 15th is actually the extension of the order was my understanding. Yeah, yeah, so this, or the state may have extended it longer, but I think the town is gonna to consider in the fall if we could do something different. You know, you know, you know, we were allowed to do it remotely, but maybe the town still might wanna have in-person for some boards or committees. But I think through August, at least it's still gonna be Zoom. You know, so I think we're, it'll all be remote. Did you see the question from Caitlin, Nate? Um, yeah, so Caitlin asked, when would the um, fiscal year start? And good question, you know, the state asked for a 12 to 18 month uh, implementation. And um, uh, yeah, I don't know when they're gonna get the awards out, so you know, my usually we apply in March and we we get the contract started in like by November first. But now we're applying September, and my thought is maybe the money will come in in January, and it'll run through the calendar year. Um, that's just my guess. So I don't, I don't, you know, I think that's probably probably. I thought, accurate. I thought that the that the press release that you put on the website said that all activities must be completed between January one. 2022 and June 30, 2023. Yeah, that's what they're guessing. So oh, okay. yeah. I think we'll learn more tomorrow. Ah. It just seems like a really fast turnaround. You know, usually if it takes six to six to eight months to get to apply and get a contract, and now they're gonna do it in you know four months. <laughs> we'll uh, see. Yeah. Right, but my guess is right. Probably, yeah. What now? You said is probably what they're trying to do. Gail, you're muted. Sorry. If there's any earth-shattering news tomorrow, will you share that with the committee? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, they put out their one-year plan, and I just read they put out their one-year plan and their draft action plan. And I looked at those today, and I didn't see anything that really. I feel like we're meeting with what they need, you know, we need to hold a public hearing, do community outreach. Um, so, you know, unless there's something that they haven't put in there's those draft plans, I feel like we're in line with what their, you know, their guidelines. Okay. Anything else? So these dates look good, you know, the RFPs will be due on the 27th, um, the, the 6th and everything. Are we, you know, I'd, I could put up a calendar if people want to look at that or Looks good. And you'll deliver us hard copies if we'd like again. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I just let me just make a note to myself. Yeah, I think. Yeah, it was great. Actually, now we, you know, um, in you know, town hall, you can town hall will be open, or we could deliver them. So yeah, I think that's actually a lot easier than what it would have been in the spring, where we would have had to have like met in the back alley and. <laughs> I, think I, did with, I did that with Lucas. Like, he did like the drive by, and I threw it through his. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's fine. That's we got sworn in also, is that back alley. Yes. For the oh. new first. <laughs> yeah. <You did. laughs> yeah, and I think, um, I don't think anyone's up for a reappointment. Rika, you may have been. I am. Yeah. I am. June 30th is the end of my appointment. Yeah, and so if you're willing to serve again, you I don't know if you have to do anything. Maybe you'll be contacted or maybe you, I don't know. If you if you email me or I can forward it on to the, um, the right staff, it's a, you know. I email you what to ask, to ask or I guess if you say you're willing if you you can email okay. them willing to serve another term or something and then I could just forward it on. Okay. Sure. Yeah. 
And as far as replacing Paul, we're kind of just kind of wait through we finish complete this cycle and then try to bring somebody on when this when we're you know well into the fall. Yeah, I emailed the town manager's office and the town clerk's office his resignation, and they knew about Andrew leaving a few. You know, he notified us well in advance, so they. I think the town had put out a notice that they're looking for board and committee members on a number of boards and committees. And so applications are coming in. So I think, you know, I can just reach out to the town manager's office and just see if there's been any, um, anyone interested and maybe, you know, maybe if there is someone and they could get appointed quickly, otherwise it might just be the five year you know, for this process. Okay. How long is the term five years? It's, uh, it's one to three years and so i think oh, okay. if you were on for a yeah, five that'd be pretty great yeah i was gonna say i i'm not wasn't sure about that <laughs> so, so it's a, yeah it's really you were on a one-year term and then great uh, and then you then it's a then it's a three-year term so you know you might be appointed for a one two or three at the first term and then you would be asked to serve for three um as your second and paul has to submit a formal resignation to paul buckleman no i think his email suffices now Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you used to actually have a have to have a letter with a original signature to resign from a committee. Um, but I think an email now is okay. Oh. Yeah. Um, all right. And I think so. If the schedule looks good and the request for proposals, I don't know if there's any other comments or. I have a question. I wondered if there's what the reasoning is, or if there's any way to change it to for the people who are presenting that we could see them. Is there a reason why we can't? Mm. Yeah, that's a, um, the town has recommended that through Zoom, we use a webinar format so that attendees don't have the ability to like Zoom bomb a meeting. So the committee, um, right, I guess we could promote someone to a panelist um, while they speak. So I guess there's a way to do that. Um, I would rec I would think it would be nice to do that. Yeah, I think that would, that would be nice. Yeah, I, I do too. Yeah, yeah. Usually if there's an applicant for a public hearing and they have a lar longer presentation, we do that. Um, the difficulty is if once someone's a panelist, they can then control the screen, you know, and show, you know, if they wanted to show inappropriate material, it'd be harder for staff to stop that. Whereas if they stay as an attendee, we can quickly, you know, prevent that from happening. So, um, but I think, I think in the future, we, let me just make a note, we, we, we can do that. Um, and then I was also wondering, just because there have been, I've been in school committee meetings and things, can the panelists, can the attendees see who's, who the okay. other attendees are? No, I think what, all we can do is, I think what I've done is, I have to check my settings. The, the, the only thing we can do is allow attendees to see the number of other attendees, but I don't think they can see who, who they are. Oh, they can't get to that list like we can. No, they can't, right? So if there's like 20 people in attendance, they can just see that there's 20 other attendees, but they can't see the names of those um, individuals. And why is that? Um, I mean, is that just a Zoom setting or is that a decision made? It seems oh, very that's a, that's a Zoom setting. Can it be a different Zoom setting? No, the most we can do is have them see the number of attendees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's been that's been asked, and you know maybe Zoom is going to come up with an update or something, but for now, they can't. And does everyone have access to the chat feature? I, I think so. I, I opened it, um, so you know a few people use the chat tonight. Um, I think I've set it so it's open to everyone. Hmm. Um, you know, so if so, so you know if someone types in. Yeah, you know, it says to all panelists. Yeah. So does that mean all participants? Oh. No, that means that they're sending, it means like when Caitlin sent her message to all panelists, we're the panelists. So all of us, oh, but instead of her sending like a private message to just one of us. Right. And actually you can do all panelists and attendees. Yeah, yeah, you can choose. Yeah, you can choose that. Yeah. So yeah, so I think that's available to anyone. Yeah. Um, yeah, and no, I think the Zoom, um, you know, we've heard a few times about being able to see everyone, but that, you know, that they don't allow that in the webinar format and we're not. We're not, it's not recommended that we, we have a meeting. So, you know, there's a meeting format where everyone is visible, but then anyone could then can take control of the screen at any time. So that's not how we, you know, we're told to set up our meetings. And as far as, um, I don't know how to ask this, you know, some people brought um, 
agency constituents tonight and some didn't mm -hmm. is there you know if somebody brings like six constituents and somebody only doesn't bring any are we allowed to just say you know you can present that means that somebody gets 18 minutes as opposed to an organization that gets three i'm just throwing that out of the time a lot it is three minutes is there a way to do we want to a lot time per agency instead of per person yeah, I think, you know, as chair, you know, I think depending on right how the conversation's going or the meeting's going, we may need to say, okay, if, if it's repetitive, can we, you know, move on or something? I think, yeah, it's difficult sometimes to know, right, who's speaking to what. Well, um, especially when you can't, I, I, I did, I couldn't right. see who was, who right. was attending. So I'm not saying I, but, you yeah. know, oftentimes agencies bring a lot of, a lot of constituents and it, it is repetitive and it, it takes up time. Yeah, so, I think. Yeah, I think we could be clear like at the next meeting um, when we're reviewing proposals that if people have comments or you know in the public hearing, um, I think one time Gail, sometimes we say, okay, let's just speak to one proposal or one priority and then we'd see how many people raise their hands and then we could try to find a way to navigate it. Yeah, a little differently. Yeah. Or we can just have a time limit. You know, you get five minutes and then you want to throw five people in for one minute. Or you don't have one person speak for five minutes, but you don't get three minutes, then three minutes, and then three minutes, and three minutes. Yeah, we can do something like that. That's like, yeah. Actually, just to clarify though, the August 17th, that's a public meeting, not a public right. hearing, but right. uh, there will be opportunity for public comment. Yeah, there's always opportunity for public comment, but at a public meeting, it's not necessary to, it's not required to have to take public comment. You know, they're available to attend and listen. And then if they have questions, they can raise their hand and you know the chair can call on them. But the public hearing is when you know we it's required and you know we you know we hope that they provide comment or questions. But right the public meeting is really a chance for the committee to hash out internally but in a public setting <laughs> what what proposals you want to recommend. Right. So Gail Gail has full discretion and uh, she doesn't have to allow any public comment if she doesn't want to. Right. <laughs> yeah, but if people I like the idea of, of having a time limit per agency that we tell them, I guess, up front. I mean, I don't know exactly what up front means. So they so they understand what it's going to happen before the meeting. That seems like it would be more helpful than doing it on the fly to me. Mm -hmm. It's a great idea, like to decide right now that it's yeah, you know, five minutes or whatever, so that they can plan. Right. All right, well, we're saying it, I think in the agenda or my notice that goes out to people, we could say, you know, roughly five, six minutes, we could say five to seven minutes or something. If you say five to seven minutes, it's seven minutes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. So I think it's like five. I like five. <laughs> because we're always hearing what we've already read. Yes, right. exactly. There's never any, I mean, not, I shouldn't say never, but infrequently, is there new information dispersed orally that you haven't already seen? visually but i think right. yes yeah, so that's to the public hearing on the 26th and we could say we can even put it as part of the notice you know approximately five minutes per proposal or something i mean we don't we can't i don't know if we can actually limit it in the hearing but i think uh as a chair we can make that decision gail and then you okay. know we can also see right how many how many attendees there are and how you know how long that could go can we also say you know feel confident that i'm just thinking like <laughs> In court, the judge will often say, "I've read your papers, so don't repeat what you've, you know, you don't need to repeat what you've submitted. I'm happy to hear more argument about something that you didn't say." Can we say that in upfront, or, or even on the agenda that we would love to hear from people, but not what's well, already there? They can know that we've read it really carefully and and feel well, confident a in court, that. A court can. I don't know if we're going to have the gavel, but. Um. <laughs> I can bring one. That would depend on the meeting though, right? I mean, if it's a meeting to talk about a specific piece of paper that's been put in, then yeah, I, I would say that's, you could probably do that, right? But yeah. if it's sort of an open hearing to talk about priorities, it's, that's hard to do. I agree. But I think we saw tonight, it was very hard for people to speak to the agenda as we described it, right? So that's why I think the limiting the time is really our best move. Yeah, I think we could do that. I think, Becky, we could reiterate just, um, you know, add new information or clarifying information. I think the question and answer that we implemented last year and doing it this year where the committee asks questions and then we get them to applicants and then that can become public. We could get that online, uh, you know, maybe the day before the um, meeting and it'll definitely be there before the hearing. I think that really helps uh, with any questions or what people are asking. Um, but I think we could ask, you know, to 
you know, maybe summarize quickly the proposal and then provide new information if necessary. I don't think I even need to summarize the proposal, right? I mean, no, they do not. I mean, I think that's where we get into trouble. trouble. And I only say that because I think we all probably are really busy all day long and want to have fresh brains to be able to talk. And it's now, you know, I've been going nonstop since 8.30 this morning and I definitely start getting tired. So I would love to just be able to keep our... Yeah, and I think one thing to be clear too is we don't... Yeah, we don't ask presentations of um, applicants. So, you know, at one point we actually asked applicants to make presentations to the committee and now we don't. It's actually just a public hearing for people to comment on their funding recommendations. Um, and I think that that's different. Um, I think what the committee had said at some point was that the difficulty there is, yeah, sometimes the presentations were just repetitive and then sometimes people would speak to things that weren't at all in the proposal and then it became confusing. Like, are you just making, was someone just making a good presentation and not really being accurate in terms of what the funding was. Um, I also would say that sometimes, um, you know, we're trying to follow a procurement process that meets, you know, state and town guidelines. And so presentations aren't necessarily part of it. And I usually we would just review proposals based on a written submission. And so that's how we do it with the block grant. So we no longer have, you know, presentations by applicants, but during the public hearing, you know, we allow comments. So we could say, you know, please provide you know, you have five minutes to provide comments on a, on a specific proposal and, you know, new information or something so we could have some language. Um, so, yeah. And Lev just asked, will the, will the committee, committee's funding recommendations be, um, be made public? And usually we do try to make them public beforehand, you know, so everyone can have a chance to know what, you know, what's being recommended. There's not a lot of time if we meet on the 17th and then the hearings on the 26th, but I think we could have at least a few days. You know, if, if the committee comes up with draft recommendations on the 17th, those could become public pretty quickly. So. All right. A lot of good work done tonight. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? I think I just want to go back and I don't mean to make this meeting go any longer. Um, and I'm just looking at my notes. What did we decide? And maybe I blinked for a minute about mental health services as a priority. Did we did we discuss that and decide to include it, or where do, where do we leave it? I think that we said that nobody raised it tonight, and I think for okay. mental health services for for youth would fall within the youth. Okay, that's the real way. I remember now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I yeah, I feel like. If there was someone doing, you know, something, they could they could probably be could include it as a few other categories, you know, or they it's other, I, I, you know. So at least we have the other the way. So if someone's saying, oh, I'm offering mental health services, it's really not related to housing. It's this, then they have the ability to explain how it fits in. Right. Yeah. Right. All right. I guess we could have a vote to adjourn, and then we'll be all set. Thanks everyone for attending. There's still a few attendees left. I'll make a motion to adjourn. I second. Any discussion? I'm one of the ones in favor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in favor. <laughs>